let us start now and go before the Lord in prayer before we continue our worship in the teaching and the hearing of his word. Magnificent Lord, thank you for this time to hear your word. Open the hearts and the minds of your people and make me nothing but a mouthpiece as you reveal your truths and instruct us in the way we should live. Amen. I titled this morning's message, Uncommon People, or Common People, sorry, Uncommon Purpose. Then I changed it to Common People, Uncommon Calling, because that's what the bulletin says. Um, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So if you want, if you so desire, you can turn there now. But let me start by asking a question. Can you think of someone that you do not know personally that is average, that is common, that doesn't stand out for any particular reason? Probably not. The only reason we know of people is because they stand out for some reason. I did a Google search for famous average people. And another one for the most famous person for being average. They both came up with the same number one result. It was an article titled, get this, Seven Celebrities Who Live Like Normal Middle Class People. Uh, thanks, Google. Really helped me out there. Can you venture a guess at who might have been on that list? The likes of Jay Leno, Sarah Jessica Parker, or Mick Jagger? Yes, real great average everyday people. These are hardly people who I would consider average. Not even by the world standards. But keep this concept in mind, the concept of the average everyday person as we dive into God's word. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians, and we're going to go from verse 1 through verse 9. The word of the Lord says, Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech, and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul begins his first letter to the Corinthians by thanking God for the grace that God has shown them and for the work of Christ among them, which is their salvation. But in the following verses, he quickly moves on to rebuke them for divisions that had cropped up among them. Read with me, continuing, continuing in verse 10 through 17. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this. That each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, 
and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. There was an unhealthy competition among the Corinthian believers that had led to divisions in the, in the church. This was distracting them from what should have been their focus. Spiritual growth, the work of the ministry, spreading the gospel. In chapter 3, Paul rebukes them again for the same thing. In verses 2 through 4, he says, For you are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? In other words, are you not just like the unbelievers? Was it that the Corinthians seemed to be so focused on these divisions, on this sense of competition among themselves, that they were not focusing on the work of the ministry? It certainly was a distraction. Why? Well, I, I present to you one simple answer. It's just our fallen human nature. Do you realize that we have a record or a ranking for almost everything? Anything you can imagine. Just think about it. Sports. There's records. There's stats keeping ever, kept everywhere. What about the Guinness Book of World Records? Did you know that there was a world record for the loudest scream? The longest fingernails? Kind of creepy. The largest ball of stickers. I have a couple of kids that might compete for that. How about this one? The most baked beans eaten with chopsticks in one minute. That's a real record. Do you see how easily we lose sight of what is important to God? We're so worried about gaining an inch over the next person. And we lose sight of God's standard. We lose sight of God's calling. We lose sight of God's purpose for our lives. That's not how Paul wants the Corinthian be believers to behave. That's not how God wants us to behave. Let's read continuing in verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. That's an interesting add to that passage there. Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. Well, in that era, according to 
the Jews, there were only two types of people. There were Jews and there were Gentiles, Jews and Greeks. Jews wanted signs. Indeed, their history, the whole Old Testament, is full of them. As God often worked in signs and wonders, and even the scribes and the Pharisees asked Jesus himself for a sign. Follow along on the screen in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 42. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. They already had a sign. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, someone greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. You see, the Jews already had their sign. Numerous signs, in fact. So many of the Old Testament prophecies pointed directly to Jesus. Now the Greeks, on the other hand, including the Corinthians, and by extension, a lot of us, wanted wisdom. Theirs was a culture that prided itself in knowledge and wisdom. After all, this is the same culture that produced the likes of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, intellectual giants of that age, and still renowned today. Knowledge and wisdom was their God, and they held it in very high regard. Does our culture today hold knowledge and wisdom in high regard? Science is our current God in our culture. But that's not the way God intended it. Verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. A stumbling block to Jews. Why? What were the Jewish people looking for? They were looking for a Messiah. But the Messiah that they sought was one that would save the nation of Israel from the Romans, not one that would save them from their sins. They didn't need saving from their sins. They were the chosen people. They had the sacrificial system. Their sins were atoned for every year, like clockwork. And foolishness to Greeks, because what kind of wisdom is there in a religion whose savior cannot even save himself? It didn't make sense. It was inconceivable to them. Beyond logic. Verse 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now this is where Paul really brings the thought, the concept of human and worldly wisdom, and its an insufficiency into perspective for the Corinthian believers. He says, starting in verse 26, For consider your calling. 
For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. First, let's consider this word calling. In verse 24, it appeared in the form of an adjective, those who are the called. What does it mean? In Greek, this is the word klesis or kletos, calling or called. And means invitation or invited as to a banquet. In the New Testament, it's specifically speaking of the divine invitation to embrace salvation in the kingdom of God. And obviously, I point this out because it's in the sermon title. We're going to come back to this concept of the invitation. But let's look at the other concept in that verse. Paul says, Not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. Now wait a minute here, Paul. What are you trying to say? I get that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is more powerful than men. But what he's saying is that the Corinthian believers were not only foolish, weak, and lonely by God's standard, but by the world's standard too. He's being very blunt. They're a bunch of unintelligent, wimpy nobodies. Do you ever feel like an unintelligent, wimpy nobody in the kingdom of God? I'll be honest, I do often. But this is not intended to be a disparaging remark. Why? Look in the next verses. Because God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may, be, may boast before God. What happens when someone of great influence changes the course of a nation? Or a renowned athlete sets a new world record? Or a genius mind comes up with an amazing new idea or theory? What happens? Doesn't the world rejoice? Doesn't the world glory in its own accomplishments? Certainly it does. That's how you know about all these people. Their name is everywhere. Their accomplishments are touted. Have you heard of this guy? That guy. Look at him, glorying, Usain Bolt, yes. <clears throat> According to Wikipedia, Usain Bolt is the world record holder in the 100 meters, 200 meters, and four by 100 meters relay. His reign as Olympic Games champion in all these events spans three Olympics. Three Olympics, 12 years he was at the top of his game and at the top of the world ranking. Due to his achievement and dominance in sprint competition, he is widely considered to be the greatest sprinter of all time. Does the world not glory in its accomplishments? Next example. I'm sure you've heard of the theory of relativity, more specifically the theory of special relativity, E equals 
mc squared. Who came up with it? Albert Einstein. All right, here's a real trivia question. When did he publish that theory? I'll give you a hint. Early, early 20th century. The theory of relativity has been around since 1905. That's when Albert Einstein first published it. Okay, 1905, that's just a year. But it was quite an accomplishment, wouldn't you say? But did you know that Einstein was born in 1879? Do the math. Do the math. That make, made him 26 years old. 26 years old when he published the theory of special relativity. Now that's an ac amazing accomplishment. It turned physics on its head and changed scientific research from that point forward. What does the world say about it? We still know his name today, over a hundred years later. By the way, that picture is from, a, from around 1905, when he was 26 years old. And I'm sure that we could each name dozens of notable figures from centuries past that have changed the course of human history. From Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, and Napoleon, to Washington and Lincoln. What about Eisenhower and Churchill? Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher? I'll stop there. I'm not going to get into modern politics. We'll save that for another sermon. Okay, those are great figures from the world, but certainly there's some better examples that we could talk about from the Bible. So let's consider three of them. Joseph, Moses, and David. Remember, Joseph was the second in command of all of Egypt. His wisdom not only saved the nation of Egypt from a great famine, but it saved the nation of Israel as well. What about Moses? Moses saved Israel from slavery. He parted the Red Sea and performed countless miracles in the desert as he led the nation of Israel to the promised land. And then there's David, the greatest king ever over all Israel. He never lost a single battle and was called a man after God's own heart. Now those are some great and renowned accomplishments, wouldn't you say? So, where does that leave us? Where does that leave you and I? I, I know my name is not going to be in the Bible. Where does that leave us unintelligent simpletons, wimpy weaklings, and inconsequential nobodies? Well, let's read on and find out. In verse 30, Paul says, but by his doing, by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Through Christ, our foolishness has been exchanged for God's wisdom. Through Christ, our weakness has been exchanged for God's power. And through Christ, our lowliness has been exchanged for redemption, sanctification, and righteousness in the sight of God. We are adopted into his kingdom and made fellow heirs with Christ. We're not lowly, we're not insignificant. We're not foolish or powerless. 
through Christ, all that has been changed. Why? Verse 31. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's a quote from Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, and I'll read it, and you can read along. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. He delights in us. He delights in giving us his wisdom, his power, and a position far above any position that this earth can offer, that this world can offer. We may be average. We may be common or nothing special in the sight of the world. But we are transformed by God and commanded to boast in Him. So how do we do that? How do we boast in the Lord? Before you can boast in the Lord, you have to have something to boast about. Right? If you're a believer, what do you have if nothing else to boast about? Your salvation. If you are saved, you can definitely boast in the fact that God saved you from eternal damnation. So let us take another look at our biblical examples. They obviously had more to boast about in the Lord than simply being chosen, right? Okay. Kind of beating on you a little bit, right? You're thinking... You certainly don't want to be compared to the likes of Joseph, Moses, and David, do you? That's a pretty high standard. Their names are in the Bible. At first glance, I wouldn't either. But remember, <clears throat> long before Joseph became the second most powerful man in all of Egypt, he was considered by his brothers to be a spoiled little tattletale. Remember when they were tending the flock? Joseph brought back the bad report against his brothers. He, they hated him so much that they plotted to kill him and then backed off a little bit and sold him into slavery. He entered Egypt not as second in command. He entered Egypt as a slave. And then worse than that, he was convicted of a crime he didn't commit and spent several years in prison. All in all, Joseph spent 13 years as a slave and in prison in Egypt before God exalted him through Pharaoh to that high post. God exalted him after some time. What about Moses? He didn't start off as the leader over all of Israel, did he? No, he didn't. And although he was saved from death as a child and grew up in the house of Pharaoh, enjoying all the benefits of royalty, he became a murderer and an exile, an outcast, and spent 40 years in Midian before God called him to be his emissary to Pharaoh. 
And then there's David. The greatest king over all of Israel, right? Do you know when Samuel came to anoint the new king, David wasn't even considered. He wasn't even considered. He was the youngest of his brothers and only 15 years old at the time. And where was he? He was out tending the sheep. He wasn't even brought before Samuel. Samuel had to ask, is there another? And then after being appointed, after being anointed as king, he had to wait 15 years more before, act before God actually put him on the throne of Israel. And eight years of that time was spent on the run from Saul, who was trying to kill him. You see, even our biblical heroes were average people. They all started off lowly nothings. And even though this is a small example of heroes in the Bible, most of them start off that way. That's the story. Only through their trust in God, marked by a life of obedience and faithful action, does God manifest the wisdom, the power, and the position that he intended for them, through which God will be honored and glorified, and of which they can boast in the Lord. All right, so what does that mean for the rest of us? For the common people, remember that calling, that invitation that Paul mentioned in verse 26? You see that it necessarily has to extend well beyond the point of salvation. Yes, we can boast in our salvation, but God has grander plans for us. God doesn't want us to stop at salvation. Let's consider the invitation and the analogy. So you're invited to a banquet, and you show up, and immediately proceed to meld into the walls or the furniture. You just disappear, because you're not the party type. You get it? I get it. You might as well not be there, because you don't converse, you don't eat, I'm gonna eat. You don't part participate in any of the activities. And you might argue that you're not detracting from anything. But you're certainly not contributing in any way either. This is not how the church of God is supposed to behave. You can't just accept the invitation and not participate in the banquet. Let's look at an example. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. Paul, again, speaking to the Ephesians this time, says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation. Got it. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast in themselves. Got it. No, no one can boast that they save themselves. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God has prepared good works for us to accomplish beyond our salvation. And he has prepared the way in which we are to walk ahead of time. Follow with me in Romans chapter 12, 4 through 6. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, but we do have a function, every one of us. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts, that differ according to the grace given to each of us. According to the grace given to, to us, 
each of us is to exercise them accordingly. We have gifts and we're to exercise them. Not only does God prepare the good works, but he prepares us as well by uniquely equipping each of us for the specific good works that he has prepared in advance for us to accomplish. Finally, read with me in Philippians verse, chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Paul, again, this time speaking to the Philippians, says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. God is preparing us through the works. Once we are invited, God doesn't just throw us into the work of the ministry and leave us to sink or swim. He prepared the good works ahead of time. And not only that, he prepares us with the skills and the talent, with the time in our schedule, with the means and the resources to successfully accomplish all the good works that he has prepared for us. And he prepares us. He grows us. He perfects us. As we, encouraged by his promises, step forward in faith and do the work that he has called us to do. You see, the thing that makes our calling uncommon is the fact that God chose common people who did not even deserve his consideration for the high calling of the work of the gospel. Before God took hold of us and saved us, we were, in fact, nothing special, not according to the world, even for those few that may have stood out by the world's standards. It was still the same process of preparation like Joseph, Moses, and David went through, during which you have to face your sin and insufficiency in the sight of God and repent. But once you arrive at the banquet, your participation is necessary. It's needed. Your participation is necessary and needed. If the runners don't run, there is no race. If the warriors don't fight, there is no victory. If the saints, those saved by the precious blood of Christ here at Gateway Bible Church, don't pray, don't spend time in the Word, don't tithe, don't teach in the children's ministry. Don't sing on the worship team. Don't attend or lead a Bible study. Don't host or go to the men's or women's fellowship. Don't do the finances. Don't run the sound booth. Don't prepare the coffee and the donuts. Sweep the floors. Update the website. Paint the walls. Update the bulletin boards. Take out the trash. Print the bulletins. Volunteer for VBS. Run Children's Hunger Fund. Edit the sermon videos. And a hundred other good works that God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. If we don't do that, there is no ministry. There is no equipping of the saints. There is no sending out 
of the beautiful feet which bring the good news of the gospel. There is no church. Brothers and sisters, God has called us according to his purposes and has prepared everything. He's prepared the works. He has prepared the way. And he prepares us. Step forward in faith, trusting in him. Trusting in him to give you everything that you need to accomplish the good works set before you by him. If you feel unequipped, pray for equipping. If you feel you don't have the time, pray for the time. If you feel that you're not good enough, God has made you more than adequate. Trust in his promises. He's transformed you. He's prepared you to do great things for him so that you can boast in him. So step forward in faith, trusting in him. Let's pray.